I remember asking Bob Woodward, the hero of Watergate, why in his all those books he wrote, where he wrote all about uh, uh, Iran Contra and William Casey and all that, why he didn't have anything about Bobby Bush in there? And he shrugged and he said, "Well, I, I guess how how did he put it? I guess he was out of the loop." So I thought, "Well, that's strange." And then I started looking at Bob uh, and discovered that Bob uh, was involved with naval intelligence before he got his job at the Washington Post and brought Richard Nixon down, uh, and that he worked for Alexander Haig. Uh, and that there was a spy ring in the White House. You, some of you may know this. Some of this is in other books. Uh, there was a spy ring in the White House being run by the Pentagon because they didn't trust Richard Nixon. Because Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger, when they got when they got in there, whatever you think of Nixon before, he'd been controlled by these same elements over all these years. And when he became president, he thought, you know what? I'm president now. Now's my chance to get my legacy. And he started all of these secret negotiations. You know the story. China, Russia with the Vietnamese uh, assault talks and all of this. He was doing all kinds of things. He, and even as, 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 as badly as some people may remember him, many of the environmental laws we have today were signed into law by him. Uh, many laws protecting workers and so forth. And so I began digging into Nixon and I started finding things in Haldeman and Ehrlichman's uh, uh, memoirs and diaries where Nixon was warning them about big big corporations, about the oil industry, about the sugar industry and their agenda to get rid of Castro because that's where the Cuba was the number one spot for sugar. Uh, and I thought, boy, I really didn't understand Nixon either. And I started thinking, what is going on here? It's like everything I ever knew was wrong. And so I called up friends of mine, uh, a Pulitzer Prize winners from the New York Times, and I said, come over for lunch. I need to talk to you. And I would just start showing them this stuff. And they would just sit there silently. And then I'd say, listen, if I'm losing my mind, you just tell me, because I, I, I need a reality check here. And there would be silence. And then the person would look at me, and they'd say, you better watch your back. They said, this is deep stuff you're doing. It's above my pay grade, but you better be careful. So somebody else, uh, an editor who I worked with for years, he said to me, you should call your book, Everything You Thought You Knew Is Wrong. And that's basically kind of what I learned, that, that uh, Richard Nixon, a little bit more about him, because I think this is sort of interesting, I tried to figure out why he kept appointing Poppy Bush to all of these positions. You know, here was this guy. You remember him? He was kind of a goofball. He couldn't speak clearly uh, any more than the sun. Uh, uh, he was, remember, he said he had trouble with that vision thing, like he couldn't really think clearly about what he believed on anything. And I thought, well, you know, how does this guy get to be president? How did his son get to be president? How did he get to be president? Well, the way that, that, that Poppy he got to be president was Richard Nixon was his sponsor. And I thought, why did Nixon do that? Nixon didn't trust anybody. Remember that? He was supposedly paranoid. He, was, he fired his whole cabinet. He only kept Poppy Bush. And so I found this thing on one of the Nixon tapes. By the way, there are only one or two tapes that everybody knows about, the smoking gun tape and, and the, the uh, cancer on the presidency speech. And I now believe those were setups for public consumption. Because if you listen to the other tapes, they cut in the other direction. Nixon's going, well, what the heck is going on here? Who were, you know, he barely knew who John Dean was until tw near the end. He was in a very low-level guy. There was a question of how he got into the White House himself. Uh, uh, in any case, um, so I, I find Nixon on a tape, and, and he, says to, he says to Kissinger, yeah, well, why don't we, Kissinger says, we need to send an envoy secretly to China. And he says, how about George Bush? And, and Kissinger says, are you kidding? He's a total lightweight. And Nixon goes, yeah, 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 that's, that's what I thought, too. So you start saying, you know, <laughs> something else going on here. And I thought, well, why is Nixon doing that? And I thought, he has, seems to have some sort of obligation to the Bush family. See, here's the clue. Some obligation to the Bush family. He appoints him... Uh, when Bush loses for U.S. Senate in 1970, he appoints him the ambassador to the United Nations. 1970, anybody who was around that knows that what a hot time that was for international relations with the Middle East. Uh, you'd had the, 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 uh, the war in 1967. You, you had all kinds of stuff going on there with Nasser, uh, Vietnam. Uh, uh, the whole world was, was in turmoil. And so who would you send to the United Nations? Would you send this goofy guy? And so I thought, that doesn't make any sense. And I actually found a reference where one of Poppy Bush's friends said to him, what the hell do you know about foreign policy? To which he laughed and said, ask me in two weeks. So he, get, he, and he actually appealed to Nixon. He, he, it was Bush who chose to go to the UN. And uh, my issue is whether he knew that Nixon was about to be taken down and that he wanted to sort of put himself out of the loop. Of course, New York 
where the UN is, not very far from New York, but he arranges to go there and he says to Nixon, you know, you need more help in social circles in New York. He was playing to Nixon's insecurity because Nixon was an outsider, grew up kind of poor, always felt shunned by the establishment. Poppy Bush was the consummate establishment and he said, if you send me there to the UN, I'll go to all those parties and I'll make you look good. I kid you not. So Nixon agreed and he sent him there and I thought, well, Nixon's a sharp guy, he's a smart guy, why would he do that? So I started looking into it, and what I discover is there is a secret history to Richard Nixon. I discover that Richard Nixon was created as a politician by Prescott Bush. And you can see sort of photographic evidence of that in the photo gallery uh, in Family of Secrets. Um, let me see if I can find that wonderful picture. Here it is. Um, I don't know if you can see it there on the right hand upper. Uh, what you see is you see two men, a shorter man and a much taller man wearing Panama hats. And the taller man is playing with the, uh, the shorter man's hat. And the shorter man looks sort of embarrassed and he has a kind of a goofy grin on his face like, I have to play along with this guy. I have no choice. The shorter man is Richard Nixon, Vice President Richard Nixon. And the taller man is little known US Senator Prescott Bush. And what I found was that in the 1940s, when Richard Nixon began his career, the official story again in all of those you know, wonderful Stephen Ambrose, whatever they are, books, the, the official story is that Richard Nixon uh, was drafted by small businessmen. And remember this, Whittier, California, and so on? They didn't like the congressman, Jerry Voorhees, because he was kind of a radical pinko commie. Well, what I found out was he wasn't a radical pinko commie. He was kind of like maybe Henry Waxman, let's say, today. He was a sort of a moderately liberal Democrat, very sober, responsible, careful person. And this was uh, about a decade after uh, the... Um, uh, after the Great Depression, and uh, uh, Congressman Voorhees was holding hearings on Capitol Hill looking into big money. He was looking into Wall Street, insurance, bankers, all this stuff, because he was afraid that if we didn't start regulating these outfits, something bad could happen again. It's kind of ironic what happened under George W. Bush uh, so many decades later. In any case, uh, so what you have is I actually established that Prescott Bush was in Whittier, California at that time, and I found in a fairly obscure writing by Jerry Voorhees, he says, I have been told that an investment banker from the East Coast is here in the district looking for someone to run against me. He doesn't say the name. But I also discovered that the Bush family company, uh, which was a defense contractor, was in Whittier right at that moment buying up defense contractors. So, and there's some more things. You put that together and you can see Nixon was beholden to the Bush family and his entire career, he had to do whatever they told him. So this gives you a whole different sense of the, the, the stuff he did, the commie baiting and everything else, whether that was his own choice or not. And it, it begins to explain why when he became president he actually turned out to be uh, a more liberal because he wanted to be liked. That's what presidents do, whether it's him or it's Barack Obama. They want to be liked. This is their, this is their big shot, you know? And they want, they want to, to win, they want to be reelected, and they want to go down in, in, in history as somebody who, who did good things. Uh, Family of Secrets goes on and talks a lot about uh, George W. Bush uh, and his secret life. And, you know, people like to dismiss him as, a, as a, a, a negligible figure, but it turns out that he really was much more formidable in many ways. Uh, he was doing secret things. His own companies that he was involved in had all these same players, these these foreign uh, money interests, uh, these these foreign dictators. They are all in there putting their money in there. And, and so you start saying, what's going on here? What, what goes on with America? 